we uh, are in a sermon series entitled 12 Words of Hope for the World. And today we come to the word faith. In Mark, the second chapter, verses 1 through 5. When he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So many gathered around that there was so many gathered around that there was no longer room for them, not even in front of the door. And he was speaking the word to them. And then some people came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. And when they could not bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And after having dug through it, they let down the mat on which the paralytic lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this fellow speak this way? It is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? The word of the Lord. It's an interesting story. I've been to Capernaum and I've seen the foundation of this house and it's very small, maybe four pews deep, about that wide, and it sat across the street or the narrow passageway from the synagogue in Capernaum. And when you're there and you see these things, it really brings time and space and truth together. What catches my attention in this story might surprise you. It's not so much that Jesus had the power to heal this man because we take that for granted, don't we? There's no limit to what God can do. What strikes me in this story are these four people who carried this man to Jesus. Now we aren't given their names we don't know anything about them. We don't know when they met Christ or how they had any sense of impact of what he could or could not do. These four people are nameless instruments of God's grace. And there are a lot of people like these four people in our world today. Nameless instruments of God's grace. Jesus heals the man, and I don't want to underestimate that or downplay the power and the grace of that, but these four people got him there. Now somebody of those four, somebody had to come up with the plan. Let's take him to Jesus. Somebody had to know that Christ could and would do something in this man's life. They had to believe that firmly or they wouldn't have gone to all this trouble. They carried and they cared for this friend enough to rearrange their lives and take on the inconvenience of it. They picked him up, dead weight, carried him through town with a plan for him to encounter Jesus Christ. And we'll call this guy Henry for the sake of the story. That seems like a good biblical name, Henry. So they had to pick Henry up and take him to an environment where something could change his life. How many people do you know today? who need to be picked up and carried to an environment where something could change their life. 
Now, using some biblical imagination, I think one of those four people was a Methodist, one was a Baptist, one was an Episcopalian, and one was a Presbyterian. Amen. And when they couldn't get Henry into this little house of Jesus, Jesus lived in Capernaum with his friend Peter, by the way, in this little uh, mud thatch roof kind of place. And when they couldn't get him into the house, my imagination says the Methodist probably said, let's put him down outside the door and put a note on him. <laughs> and maybe when the Bible study's over, Jesus will come out, trip over him and heal him. And Methodists move around so much that the guy probably couldn't stay long enough to wait. And you know I love the Methodist, I used to be one. The Baptist could have said though, if we just had enough water, we could baptize him and that would take care of all of his problems. If we just dunk him. And then after that, make sure he ties the tenth of his income to the church and goes to Sunday school and church. Wednesday and Sunday and Sunday night. Now the Episcopalian likely pulled out a prayer book and looked up a prayer for, quote, what to pray when you can't get someone in to see Jesus. <laughs> and that's on page 287. They have a prayer for everything. And you know what the Presbyterian did? He recommended they form a committee to study paralysis. <laughs> Now, Henry would have died before the Presbyterians did anything to help him. <laughs> well, what they did do, these four people, is they tore open the roof. Now, that is no small thing. A mud thatched roof and the house is full of people and Jesus is teaching the word and all of a sudden a little trickle of dust comes down and then a, a branch and the Bible study has been totally disrupted and all of a sudden dust and debris and chaos is spilling in and they are taking the roof off of Jesus's house. I don't think I would have done that. <laughs> They're destroying the property of the Lord because they are so driven to get this man's life changed. What that says to you and to me is there are times when we have to take off the roofs. There are times when things are inconvenient. There are times when the plan doesn't work the way we planned it, so we go to plan B. There are times when this is so important, this issue, this person, this one solo man is so important that I will even tear the roof off of the house of Jesus Christ to get him in there. That's how driven these four people are. And in order to do that, you have to believe that Jesus can do something once you get him there. That's where I think the church is floundering today. I'm not sure we're still convinced of the power of Jesus Christ to transform human life. And when you lose that, you lose the drive to get other people in his presence. You, dr you lose the determination. You lose the sense of urgency that this person needs to meet the Lord. Oh, I'll bring them to church, but I'm not so sure I know how to bring them to Christ. And those can be two different things. 
They removed the roof above him and after having dug through it, they let down the mat on which the paralytic lay. Get your head around that. The time is now to do something. Now is the time for something to happen in this person's life or in my life. Now is the time for God to touch my life or his life or her life. There's a time to wait and there's a time not to wait. There's a time to act. And what a privilege it is that God uses human instruments in the healing process these four nameless people. So when they lowered Henry into the room, the Bible says that Jesus saw their faith. Now that's interesting. Jesus didn't see the interruption. Jesus didn't see the debris. Jesus didn't see that his roof was missing. All of that can be fixed. Jesus, it doesn't even say Jesus saw the paralysis. What he saw was their faith. And it didn't say his faith. It didn't say Jesus saw his faith, the paralytic's faith, Henry's faith. It says he saw their faith, all five of them working as a unit. Sometimes we need other people to carry us with their faith. They have the faith. Maybe I don't. Maybe I lost mine. But the four of them are carrying me with their faith. You ever had anybody carry you with their faith? Oh, yeah. That's called your mama. Who carried you with her faith. Or your grandmother. Or as in the baptism case today, your great-grandmother. Who carries you in your faith when you can't carry yourself. These four were instruments of God's work in the world. God didn't just find Henry and say, I don't want you to be paralyzed anymore. Poof, you are no longer paralyzed. No, it was a human endeavor with a divine consequence. These were working together in tandem. I'm bringing him, you're healing him. That's the church. Bringing people to an environment where something can happen to change who they are. It's amazing God would use us for this. In Hebrews, the definition of faith is this. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Let me say that again. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So here's what faith is not. Faith is not wishful thinking. I wish the Lord would do this. I wish the Lord would do that. It's not blind belief in a body of doctrine like I have faith in the resurrection or I have faith that the Holy Spirit's here. Like you believe in Santa Claus or the tooth fairy. That's not faith. It's not manipulating God as if to say, if I have enough faith, maybe I can get God to do this or to do that. That's not faith. Faith is knowing something, says the Bible. The assurance of things. Assurance, I know it. Assurance, I know it. Of things hoped for. I'm not just wishing. I have assurance of this thing. I know it. The conviction of things not seen. This is faith. It's knowing something like you know you're sitting here, but that something is not yet here and it is not yet seen. I just know it. I don't have to believe it. I don't have to wish it. I don't have to think about it. I know it. Faith is knowing. I don't think we've talked enough about this. And so people end up having faith and get a parking spot at Walmart. That is just heresy or something. 
But faith is knowing something. Like I know you're here and you know I'm here. There's no question about it. Oh no, it's faith. These four people in Henry knew something before it happened. Jesus saw their faith. They knew Christ would heal him. And it's what drove them, drove them right through that roof. But I want you to be careful about faith because in Ephesians it says this, for by grace you've been saved through faith and this is not of your own doing. Those are important words. This faith is not of your own doing. In other words, you don't just get up and conjure up enough faith. I wish I had the faith that she had, you know, and if I just got up in the morning, worked harder at it. No, 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 that's not faith. By grace, you've been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. Listen to this. It is a gift from God. God lets you have faith. God gives you faith. God lets you have this assurance and this conviction of things unseen. You don't conjure that up. It's not about academics. It's not about emotions. It's a gift from God. Not the result of works, says Ephesians, so that no one may boast. So faith is not something we do, but something that God does in us. It's a gift. So here's the question. Do you think the world we live in today needs this faith? It strikes me that there are all kinds of paralysis in the world right now as we speak. People are paralyzed for different reasons. People are paralyzed this morning by addictions. Catherine and I have some friends whose son is suffering deeply from long-term systemic addictions. He's paralyzed. Could Christ heal him? There are people who are paralyzed with anger and they've been carrying that anger for a very, 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 very long time. It's like acid in their soul. They're paralyzed. Terrorist ISIS is angry. And that anger is spilling over into every dimension of our world and culture. People are paralyzed by hatred. Blue people hating red people. Republicans hating Democrats. While our big issues are sitting on the table and we're divided and paralyzed by hate. Do you think these people could be healed? People are paralyzed by homelessness, by depression, by loneliness, by racism, classism, sexism, fatalism, hedonism, materialism, legalism, radical individualism, emotionalism, and even spiritualism. Paralyzed. And then in our culture, there is a growing sense of nihilism from the Latin word nil, which means nothing. Nihilism is the rejection of all religious and moral principles. Paralyzed. Henry. He's us. That's who he is. And the question is whether there is a cure for these paralysis. And does the church believe that Christ is that cure? Do we still believe this? Would we tear the roof off this place in order to get those who are paralyzed to Christ? A world without faith would be a world of hopelessness and despair. Who or what will cure us is the real question. We've got enough analysis and we've got plenty of diagnosis. It's 24 seven on TV, pick your channel, pick your spin. But at the end of all the diagnoses, don't you want the doctor to say, but here's what we can do in the treatment of your disease. That's what's missing. How will we be cured? 
It would do the church well in this modern society to renew itself to Christ. To the one who does the healing of the human heart. And it would do us well to dig through the roofs of our own resistance. Bringing ourselves and others to the one who reconciles the world to God. In him we have our hope. And in him we place our faith. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.